Hi, welcome to another episode of David Rides a Trike. I'm David, I'm riding a trike. If this is your first time watching one of my videos, I try to provide a little bit of motivation for people to get up, get out and do something active to make themselves feel better, specifically for people with chronic illnesses and conditions. Personally, I was a type 1 diabetic from the time I was a year and a half old until I was 41. I've had three organ transplants, cancer, borderline legally blind, more surgeries than I could count, and a bunch of other stuff. And today I'm going to tell you a little story from my past. So grab yourself a cup of coffee or a beverage of your choosing and pull up a chair. In 1994, my friend Chris and I decided to do the American Diabetes Association's New England Classic. The New England Classic was a, and still is, a one week, 500 plus mile bike ride through New England as a fundraiser for the American Diabetes Association. On the second night of the ride, we got to the college dorm where we were staying overnight and we gave our bikes to the mechanic, the bike mechanic, who was along for the ride. They had a mechan full-time mechanic with us the whole time, which was great. Just for a tune-up, check our bikes out. He finished Chris's and was working on mine, and he said, boy, you guys must be really strong riders. Chris and I both turned to each other with a look of, what the hell is he talking about? Because we, while we did a good amount of riding, we didn't consider ourselves really to be really strong riders. I said to him, what do you mean? He said, well, you're gearing. You don't have much in the way of really low gears and we're going to be headed into the mountains. For those of you who don't know, you want low gears when you're doing climbing because it allows you to pedal more easily up the inclines. So we just, we both said, these are the gear sets that came with our bikes when we bought them. And the mechanic said to us, where are you from? And we both said, Chicago. And he goes, oh, Flatlanders. Apparently, in flat areas of the country, they sell bikes with a different set of gears than they do in mountainous areas. We said to him, is there any place do you know of that we could get new rear cassettes so that we could have an easier time? And he said he really wasn't sure just check the bike shops when we get into the next town. Now, this was on Sunday. We rode Monday, and Tuesday we were headed for the Kankamagus Highway, otherwise known as the Kank. It is a pretty famous or infamous bike route. It's a, it's a high, it is a highway, there are cars, but it's a well-known bike route that just goes up and up and up. So Chris and I, sorry, this thing's getting a little heavy in my hand, trying to find a comfortable position. Actually, I might pull over and talk to you. The next night we pulled into North Conway, New Hampshire. We called the local bike shop and fortunately for us, they had two rear cassettes like we wanted. So we went down, got our bikes and rode into town and picked them up, came back and the mechanic put them on our bikes. The next morning we hit the kank after about eight or nine miles of riding. Now, I don't know how long this ride 
is or how high it goes. We were told that it was 26 miles long and never levels off. And it sure felt that way. We got to the point where we were so beat that we would go from light pole to light pole, stopping at each one and slathering Ben Gay with mentholatum to warm up our legs in between each one. But we kept going and going and going and we finally got to the top. And we were pretty proud. We rode the entire thing, unlike many of the locals who took the sag wagon up. So now we ate some lunch and thought we just had an easy, fast descent down. We went down and it was pretty flat for a while. And then we turned on to a highway. Not only was it a busy highway and it, bikes were allowed, but we were told that it's a main route for loggers, giant trucks carrying huge trees that had just been cut down. And the drivers of these trucks have a tendency to try and frighten cyclists by moving over onto the shoulder and trying to scare them or even force them off the road. And we definitely encountered that. Finally, we finished that and turned onto a much quieter road. But it wasn't over. All of a sudden we started climbing and climbing and climbing again. And it went on and on and on. After about 20 miles of this, we got to the final rest stop. It was about two miles, I think, from the top of the climb. And uh, we pulled over at the rest stop and just collapsed on the grass. And we started talking about the possibility of taking the sag wagon the rest of the way. Sorry, my battery died. <laughs> um, so Chris and I were sitting in this grass a couple miles from the top, still about 23 miles from the end of the day's ride, and started talking about maybe taking the sag wagon the rest of the way. And Chris said that he could just hear his dad calling him a quitter if he took the sag wagon. Chris's dad had passed away quite a number of years ago when Chris was just a teenager and we were both adults at this time. And him talking about his dad made me think about my own dad and not about quitting. Rather, I started getting enraged. My dad had died from diabetes and diabetes was trying to kill me. I was doing this ride to try and raise money to find a cure so that maybe someday in the future a cure would be found. My dad in his early to mid 60s started losing his vision went bl completely blind, had to stop working. He could no longer read, which was one of his favorite things in life to do. And he really just kind of gave up on life and died in his sleep when he was 66. I was so furious at diabetes. It was almost bringing tears to my eyes. And all I could do was stand up, I put my bike helmet back on and said to Chris, I have to go. And I headed for my bike and got on. And Chris was right on my heels going, Dave, where are you going? What's up? I couldn't even talk. I couldn't explain it. I didn't have the words to explain the fury I was feeling. And I was thinking, this is a battle between me and diabetes. I am going to win this battle. I may not win the war, but I'm winning this battle. And I rode and rode. I kept telling myself, pedal, pedal, pedal. Don't coast, pedal. And I just kept turning those cranks. 
and Chris kept trying to talk to me, asked me what was going on, and I literally just could not talk. Finally, we reached our destination for the night, and we pulled in. I was able to relax. At the time, I explained it as best I could to Chris. And I felt good. I felt like I had won that battle. Something I thought I couldn't do, I did. That day, we rode over 90 miles, almost all of it was uphill. No, very little descending, other than the descent down the kank, that was about it. The anger I had, there was also anger, anger for uh, Charlie, the sadist who planned this day's route, but my anger at diabetes and being affected by it and other people being affected by it and how it devastates lives just drove me. And I've tried to find that motivation other times when I've been riding for other things. And it's not something I could ever just summon up of my own free will. It had to be the right circumstance that brought it on. And hopefully, you can find a little bit of motivation from something in your life to get you to get up and be a little more active and do something that's fun. You'll enjoy it, trust me. It's fun to be outside and do, doing something active. Well, that's about it for this episode. I would appreciate it if you could push that little thumbs up like button down below and press the subscribe button and then a little bell will appear. If you could prod that, it's a notification bell so that when I have a new video, you'll be alerted that I have one. If you have any comments, I'd love to hear from you. Please put them down below. That's it for this episode of David Rides a Trike. I'll see you on the next ride. Bye-bye.